I had to have more help, though, than, than Joe Song. I had to have more help than Ron Shaw. I needed an individual in our office that was energetic, that was young and flexible-minded enough to learn, hopefully take some direction from me, and I couldn't find one that I felt like would fill those requirements. But I had a state supervisor over in the state of Nebraska, running around single, chasing girls and raising cane all night, and I needed to bring him in where I could hold him down a little bit. So I invited Steve Bohr to come over to Corning, Iowa. He walked in there looking like John Bushall just crawled off a Bronx somewhere in Oklahoma City. But he has turned himself into as qualified bargainer of livestock for this organization as you will need to have. He has commanded and gotten the respect from those individuals we do business with on a daily basis. They don't call for Walt Hackney anymore. They call for Steve because they know that what he expresses has got my endorsement because I have total, full confidence in what he does as a bargainer for your products. I want you to welcome Steve. He works hard. He's totally sincere and committed to your cause. I think you deserve him. I think he deserves your support. I'd like you to welcome Steve Bohr, the Assistant Director. Bobby Cox from Montana gave you a very basic description of the initial concept of collective bargaining. Ron Shaw from the Home Office described to you in detail the National Farmers Organization collection, dispatch, and delivery system. You also heard Joe Psalm give you the first-hand facts on what these programs along with the marketing system you now have available to you, has accomplished. Many of you probably recognize these as being the same system you've had available to you for quite a number of years. Yes, it is the same. And I might add the very best complete saturation program that exists. Over the past year, we've had to develop a rapport with the packing industry that would allow us to move them cattle other than on the grade and yield program. We have devoted most of the past year to overcoming this before we could put a complete marketing system into effect. This was more of a problem than what many of you may realize. The reputation this organization had for marketing cattle was totally unacceptable. We in the Home Office had to use our own reputations and in fact hang our own carcasses on the line to get this system started. Well, that paid off and now the industry has confidence in this organization for supplying them the kind and quality of cattle needed for their requirements. Another serious problem we have overcome in the past year is to gain confidence of the farmers and ranchers. Without participation and cooperation from cattle feeders and cow-calf people, there isn't a system available in the country that will ever achieve you your cost of production plus a profit. We are doing our best to cooperate with you. You asked us for a more flexible marketing system. Because of these requests, we have set up for you the most lucrative marketing system available to the farmers and ranchers today. 
This graph shows you that at this time, one year ago, 96% of the cattle being marketed through the National Farmers Organization system were sold on the grade and yield program. At the present time, 63% of the cattle marketed are on the grade and yield, and the remaining 37% are either sold flat in the beef or on a live basis. What this means is that we had to prove to the packing industry that we had people who were professionally qualified to the point that we could sell them cattle using our own description. We have also, through our much better rapport with the packing industry, over the past year, been able to greatly improve those grain yield formulas. This shows you that in January of this year, we have come from a $2 over the sheet off fall credit to $6 over the sheet currently. On a 600 pound carcass, this means that you are currently receiving $36 per head where in January you were receiving $12. This could never have been accomplished without first gaining the type of respect that your organization now has with the packing industry. Even though that this is the marketing system that you asked for, it is abused every single day by farmers and ranchers somewhere in the nation. Either you call us and say, for instance, that if we can sell cattle flat in the beef, that you would like us to sell your cattle for you. Right there, you've taken the flexibility out of the program by not giving us the opportunity of making the decision of which basis of marketing will net you the most dollars. Flexibility in selling is the backbone of a lucrative marketing system. Another serious problem that we have overcome The next most common thing that happens is that you will call us to get a price that you can use against your local buyer to put pressure on him. If you feel that that creates competition in marketing, then at least don't use the only people available to you that are creating better markets for you and trying to preserve the family farm. We wouldn't be here, and this organization wouldn't exist if there wasn't a drastic need for it. You cannot depend on the government or anyone else to solve these marketing problems for you. Let's look at some very startling facts. The first part of this year, we were enjoying some very decent profits on fed cattle. This beef price was quite a problem to the government's anti-inflation program. The only tool that they had available that they could use to curb this problem was psychology. So on Tuesday, May 30th, the government made the announcement that they might raise the beef imports. In the next few days, after that announcement was made, the national provisioner that had choice steers quoted at $96 per hundred 
dropped five dollars per hundred and they had only announced that they might raise the import on wednesday june 7th one week later choice steers were still quoted at 91 dollars per hundred that same day the government made the announcement that the imports were about to be raised. At this time, your National Farmers Organization President, Orrin Lee Staley, was making appeals to maintain the beef import quota standard. The very next day, Thursday, June 8th, the announcement was made. The imports were boosted by 15% to reduce hamburger prices. You still had a $91 choice steer market. At that time, we were also urging cattlemen to move any cows they possibly could to stay away from that normal fall glut season. On Tuesday, June 13th, two weeks since that rumored intent that the government might raise the imports, Choice steers were at $90 per hundred. One week later, on Tuesday, June 20th, that cattle price hit the skids and lost $4 per hundred to $86 in the beef. Two days later, on June 22nd, Washington put out a federal publication titled plentiful beef supply dips to only adequate or only enough to meet the needs of the consumers. We had only enough beef to meet the consumers' needs, yet that same day, choice steers dropped another $4 per hundred to $82 in the beef. The very next day on June 23rd, the government made the statement that their decision to raise the beef imports by 200 million pounds had very little to do with the recent decline in beef prices. However, they said there could be some psychological effect. And choice steers slid another dollar and a half to 8050. Ladies and gentlemen, from May 30th to June 23rd, choice steers dropped fifteen and a half dollars per hundred, or ninety-three dollars per head, in spite of a steadily declining federal inspected slaughter during that period. Throughout the rest of the summer, beef prices stayed at this depressed level. In September, beef prices moved up by only $3 per hundred. And on October 6th, the government called this September rise as being obviously disappointing and particularly disheartening. The government claimed that this small rise in beef prices further complicated phase two of their anti-inflation program, definitely admitting their desire to maintain a cheap food policy, no matter what the outcome would mean to the family farmer. This is what happens to you and is going to continue to happen to you if you insist on waving those independent flags and refuse to collectively bargain for your cattle. The same way that psychology is used against you, we use it for you. It was psychology that allowed us to move our grain yield agreement from $2 over the sheet in January to six dollars over the sheet currently. When we take the numbers of cattle turned into us and group those numbers into a block, it's the psychology of that block 
that makes those cattle worth so much more than they're ever going to bring you independently. Volume makes psychology work for you or against you. The items you see listed on this sheet will all affect the market either in a negative or a positive manner. For instance, the cattle listed on the on-feed report may not be moving for five or six months, but will affect the market the day that report is quoted. The terminal deliveries, the import fluctuations, the actual Chicago Mercantile Exchange deliveries, I told you that this spring we were urging cattlemen to move any cows they possibly could to stay away from that normal fall glut season. We wanted these cows moved prior to the fall month when the government purchases their institutional and school lunch beef. Let me tell you what happened. This spring, we had an average cow market of 40 cents a pound live. In August, when the government always needs and normally has a depressed cow market, we had an average of 41 cents a pound live. That's what effective collective bargaining does. It not only works for you at the present time, but assures you of profitable markets for months ahead. There isn't such a thing as being too small or too large for collective bargaining not to work. This organization at one time definitely had problems with large volume. You heard the conversation that Joe Salm quoted to you that I had with that packer in Wisconsin. The larger the volume, the better the system operates now. That conversation was not an example of something that has only happened in the state of Wisconsin, but is an example of the type of rapport this organization now has with packers across the nation. We've made agreements with packers that a couple of years ago flatly refused to do business with the National Farmers Organization. The industry now realizes that the way your business is being handled makes you a very important factor in their business. In the last couple of years, the three largest independent packers in the nation, Iowa beef packers, Missouri beef, and Spencer Foods, have all merged with large corporations. Ladies and gentlemen, the impact of these mergers may not seem to be of much importance to you as cattle producers across the interior of these United States. Let me explain to you precisely what these developments mean to you as that proud independent cattle feeder trying to compete. The corporation that is currently attempting to merge with the second largest packer in the country is also considered to be the largest cattle feeding corporation in the nation. This corporation has recognized the necessity to combine that huge volume with the people that have the talent to process and distribute that beef for them. So consequently, the merger. This corporation, as a cattle feeder, as do the other two corporations, has the ability to supply 20% of their own kill requirements. Where does this leave you? 
as that proud independent cattle feeder trying to compete with that corporation, it means this. When that cattle buyer drives into your yard to buy your cattle, he already has 20% of his requirements taken care of by his parent corporation. It means he'll be 20% less competitive in his bidding. It means your profit potential has diminished by 20% by his lack of demand for your cattle. On the same token, the existing independent packers who do not have the luxury of this 20% being supplied to them by a parent corporation have 100% demand for your cattle. It is these packers that you've heard about here today. They recognize the extreme necessity to cooperate with the independent cattle feeders of this nation. They also express a definite desire to bargain with the National Farmers Organization. These independent packers recognize a trend with these corporate mergers that could be disastrous to the American cattleman and the family farmer. They realize that we are the only people available that have the marketing system that will preserve the family farm and thus change the operations of the entire meat industry. Thank you.